Good evening and welcome to CU at USC. I'm your Monday night host, Alexia Narcisse, and I'm here today with Rick Bursky, who is a marketing and advertising connoisseur. Let's get started. So I can be able to go home tomorrow. Daddy's gonna be so excited. That killed him. Paging Dr. Palmer, Dr. Barbara Palmer, dial 452. And we are back with Rick Bursky, the man behind the magic, the man you just saw that created that commercial there. Now, I have to know how you even came up with that concept because it's hilarious. The campaign, the whole campaign idea was don't judge too quickly. And the overall campaign was done by another creative team. And everyone in the agency that was going to be in the Super Bowl had to come up with ideas. There's a lot of money at stake. And yeah. the client wanted to be in the top 10 the next day in uh, USA Today. And I was working with Christiana Brooks, my partner of many times. Awesome. And we went to a restaurant, an Italian restaurant on Ocean Park, I forget the name now. We spent <laughs> the afternoon drinking and eating pasta. And that's where the brain, like where it cre was created, well, the brainchild of it? Think it's a misdirection. And if you look at advertising, a lot of advertising is a formula. And there's a formula for this campaign. Mm -hmm. But you just think, right, misdirection. So obviously we're talking about the fly. The mother walks in with the little girl. The line comes up and it's, uh, and it's all about being judged badly judged wrong incorrectly okay but now it, it was a fun idea and that was our train fly was <laughs> i was gonna say it, how do you train a fly we had a fly wrangler to work on the set <laughs> so they bring in the flies they bring in a, a tupperware thing of plastic flies and you pick out the fly you want <laughs> and so the guy says what do you need him to do i said we need him to play dead and when he comes up to you know where you know wing his flap his wings could you train him to do that he goes yeah it's like wow could you how could you do that and he did I'm just curious as to how you can even, how do you find a fly wrangler? There's like, it's, I guess a society There's of fly wranglers. There's a community wranglers. of fly yeah, wranglers. Yes. He was actually uh, a professor of bugs. I forget what the word is. Okay. Yes, and he made more money as a fly wrangler for TV and movies. So they're little actors. Yes, so actually the way he I really did I hope they get it, like paid time off and Oh, uh, We actually had to have someone from the Humane Society say no animals were hurt in the making of this commercial. And that's the God's <laughs> honest truth, we did. Uh, so. We told him what we wanted him to do. He goes, oh, that's an easy one. So what you do is <laughs> you take the fly and put it in a little plastic Tupperware and you put it in the refrigerator and it gets cold and falls asleep. So then he's sleeping. Oh. You take the fly and you put him on the patient and then the lights like right here are hot uh -huh. and he starts to wake up and as he wakes up, he flaps his wings. So then you just run that part in reverse. Wow. And that's how that was done. That is actually mind boggling. I can't even <laughs> imagine. The amount of money that goes into making a commercial is incredible. I can't even imagine. Now, if you would blow up the fly going around the room, that's a computer generated fly going around the room. Okay. Uh, you would see it would be a fly that would be, look like a real fly that would have been in this area. Cause we spend money, we would find a guy who would tell us which flies would be in this area. Yeah, it would be. And then they it. would find the computer guy, make it. And then you get the audio engineer to get the real sounds of the fly. And then you make it so when it's further away, it's like not very loud when it yeah. comes up. So all the nuances that go into making the commercial. Goodness gracious. And you, I'm imagining you guys had a huge budget because this was a Super Bowl commercial. Uh, not as much as you probably spend on this set right here, but we had a lot of money, <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I'm assuming you're recycling that money. This yes. is a one-time, yes. throw it, it in is, there. There is a hospital in Hawthorne that is just, it used to be a real hospital, just used to shoot TV shows, movies, and we rented the hospital. Oh, okay. And for that 30 seconds, we shot for about five hours. Now, did you guys know beforehand that it was going to be for the Super Bowl? Yes. How does yes. that work? Like, do you clients, submit something you know, and say? Client says in advance, it was one of our clients at DDB. Uh -huh. uh, I want to be in the Super Bowl, and this is his second year in the Super Bowl. And there's a lot of money at stake, and he wants it to be good. So the agency, oh, big wow. famous agency, Doyle, Dana Birnbach, 
They have everyone pitching ideas. They have from different offices pitching ideas. Forget about getting on the Super Bowl. Just getting the idea to the client is a big deal. You feel like you won. Mm -hmm. And then when it goes on the Super Bowl, forget about winning awards with it. You feel like you won just it's on the Super Bowl because everyone in the world knows. Wow. And, uh, but there was like, oh, probably 300 ideas pitched to the creative director, and he brought about a dozen to the client. So it's this giant funnel that goes Goodness on forever. Gracious. Okay, and when you're creating a pitch, what does that look like? Because I know for TV, are you actually drawing it out? Are you just going uh, in and saying, oh, the fly comes in the room? Well, when we pitched dead. to Mark, the executive creative director, Mark Montero, great guy now retired, but I worked for him for many years. So Christiane and I, we, we basically had write-ups, and we probably had a dozen. Wow, and uh, okay. so they're written up a paragraph, and then we pitched to Mark that because he you know, was a creative guy, so he could have vision. And once it gets past him and goes to the client, there'd be a key frame, okay. like maybe a key frame or two, and you'd pitch it like that. And then you pray to God, you you kill a small animal for a sacrifice and do all that stuff. <laughs> you guys had multiple awards due to that one commercial. Yes. And I noticed that you've done commercials from Skechers yeah. to beer companies yeah. to tablets. Yes, everything. How does that work? Do well, you reach out to these companies? or? Well, you're, I'm on staff. I was on staff at the time with a very large agency. So okay. 14 years with DDB, which in advertising is a lifetime. Yeah. But this to clients, they pitch. And you get those clients. Like I worked for AmeriQuest for years. I there, you know, direct mail, radio, all these things. Yeah. So it's just if you're gonna be an ad writer, you have to be a chameleon. You can't say I'm only doing funny stuff, I'm only doing serious stuff, because right after the Super Bowl commercial could be Forest Long could be your client and there's gonna be yes. very little funny jokes about <laughs> Forest Long. So you just you know, you just do whatever comes your way. Yes, and speaking of chameleon, you have done everything from print work to visual work, to it is. commercials. And do you guys have any, if we could pull up an example of some of his work outside of the realm of broadcast, hopefully they will. <laughs> we'll give them a minute. Yes, but it but is, uh, how do you, I mean, because you have to be able to think in so many different formats. Uh, you have to be able to download the information of a, you, a print article different than a video. Well, it is, it, it is different, but it, it starts with you have to you think creatively. It's a learned skill. Uh -huh. And the class, one of the class I teach here, I just did a midterm and there was a question on the midterm. It says creativity, is, no, talent is, and the correct answer is meaningless. Because talent is meaningless. These are learned skills. And you learn to think a certain way and there's certain principles you apply. Ah, yes, it is uh, <laughs> yeah, Liptini. The Liptini commercial. And if I remember, print that, and if I remember correctly, that is the husband of the woman who owned the company. And Make him want your lips. Yes. Well, one of the techniques for doing advertising is to mm -hmm. take an expression and bring it to life. Mm. So, uh, Chris John and I, we keep talking about, you know, what does a woman want? You know, you want someone to want your lips. So it's like, hey, let's just bring that to life. So there you, you have it. You guys just flipped it. Yes. Now, do you consider yourself a comedian? No. Not I at all. I have no sense of humor. That's impossible. No These ads are hilarious. My brother, just by coincidence, is a comedian. Okay. He was the youngest comic to be on the Tonight Show the first time. Wow. Team, yes. But I have no sense of humor, and I don't see, there's nothing funny about that. That's life. impossible. I mean, looking yeah. at these ads, they're hilarious, and it I is. wonder how you can just think of them naturally. Here's another one. Warmest holiday wishes from the place that has everything. Well, almost. This was the first ad I did that won an award. It was for the Beverly Hills Hotel, okay. and it was working at the Evans Group, an agency that was in L.A., and there's a, a lesson here. When I was in college, there was a guy who came and speak, spoke to the school, and God, I'm blanking on his name now. A very famous graphic designer, Milton Glaser, okay. very famous graphic designer. And he came and gave a speech, and I was in the auditorium, and he said something I'll never forget. He said when he was starting out in his career, there were other guys starting that became famous, Saul Bellow. No, that's a famous writer. But other guys Saul Bass. the same, okay. And they were all juniors together, and they got better assignments than him, and he was always angry about that. But hmm. then he realized, realized at a certain point, they didn't get better assignments. They all got the same shitty assignments. It's just, it's just they knew what to do with them. Hmm. When they got a small assignment, they didn't treat it small. So there I was, sitting in the auditorium, undergrad, my first year of college, and that stuck with me. So I'm working at this agency, and an assignment comes along. One of the clients was the Beverly Hills Hotel to do their Christmas card, and none of the other teams wanted the assignment because it's, it's, like, it's not a great assignment. Yeah. <laughs> So my partner and I took it, and we treated it like it was important. And the card was on the front, season's greetings from the place that has everything. And it would go out to their expensive, rich clients all over the world. And then you open it up, well, almost covered in snow. Well, it was a big hit. The client loved it, and it ran as a full page in the New Yorker, and it ran in languages all over the world. Wow. So that was a great example, something I learned in school. You know, you get yeah. a small assignment, don't treat it small. Now, you teach as well. So yes. I'm assuming that that really resonates in yes. what you expect from your students. Yeah, it is. It is. 
one of the things I believe for a teacher, your job, my job isn't just teaching them because you get smart kids here, they'll learn. You need to inspire them to do good work. Mm. You need to make them believe it's possible. And it is. It's so first night of class, I often ask the class, I said, how many people in this class think they're more talented than I am? And maybe one person will raise their hand and I'll say, okay, everyone leaves, he gets to stay. Wow. Because the truth is you're all more talented than I am because I have no talent. I just have hard work and passion, dedication, and that's all you need to make it also. I already feel inspired just by well, hearing Well, it it's, it's the truth. That's, I mean, you know, I don't teach math, so there's no formulas, but I teach them anything's possible. Mm. Now, in a class like that, I'm assuming that you're teaching more so even life lessons. Yes. Just in understanding. Yes, to follow directions, like put your name on your homework. That's a <laughs> tough one. Man, does it make me crazy. For people who are the, above the age of 20, you would think. Oh, my God, you would, that wouldn't we you? would have it, right? Yes, you would think. <laughs> Now, in addition to your advertising work, I noticed that you have so many passions listed out on your website. So I, <laughs> I, I printed up a few, yes. and I'm, I'm assuming that we're going to have to talk about the rest of these for the second half. But I want to know about a few of these. Okay. The first one is that there were two mentions of your name over dinner at David Ogilvie's house. I worked for a guy for many years, Bruce Silverman, who was okay. a real madman. From this, he started in the '60s at, at Ogilvie Mather. And then he's created like a president of an agency I work for. And one day he says, hey, I'm taking a week off. I'm going to France and I'm going to visit David Ogilvie. And I said, oh my God, tell him I said hello. He goes, you don't know him. I said, I just want to be just able to say my name was mentioned <laughs> in his house. So uh, Bruce goes over to the chateau, sees David. And he goes, by the way, Rick Bursky says hello. And David says, don't remember the name. Did we work with him in New York? Because you never met him. And he goes, well, you know, what's going on? He, goes, he just wanted to be able to say his name was mentioned. He goes, let it be known for all of time. His name was mentioned over dinner. Twice. Yes. This is incredible. Okay, we're gonna have to move on to the next one. Now, <laughs> I'm glad that right. was clarified. You have a mention of your name in a book by the ex-director of the about CIA. About the ex-director of the CIA. I'm okay. a footnote <laughs> in one of one. David Petraeus's, a book about David Petraeus, Four Stars. Okay, what was the footnote? What was? I, uh, I, he was a lieutenant when I was a sergeant in the army. I was in the paratrooper, the 509th Airborne Battalion Combat Team, where he was a young lieutenant. Wow. Okay. And went to France with him. A bunch of us went to France to go to the French Army Paratrooper School. Yeah. And we made a jump in the Pyrenees Mountains, and we were walking down a road, and I always had a camera with me. And uh, I was walking in, fr in front of him. He goes, hey, Sergeant Bursky, take a picture. I want to send it to my mom. And wow, I took a picture cool. of this young Lieutenant Petraeus, and uh, it was on the web. And it ended up with some writer writing a book, and they called to interview me. So I got wow, a footnote in the book. that's awesome. But it's hard to believe this young guy, who's a nice enough guy, lieutenant, became <laughs> At the, time. the big guy. But I told him how to run a war, how to run the army. And wow. Okay. And, and I that noticed part's that not true, but you served quite some time in the armed forces. Well, not quite some time, but I was there for a while. <laughs> I'm wondering why you haven't done advertising for the army yet. I tried to pitch that account. Uh, when I was at DDB, they were looking for an agency, and I tried to get DDB interested in pitching the account. You're their guy. But uh, there's, it's such a big account. There's so much money. An agency would have to be prepared to drop a couple million dollars on pitching it. And you know, I tried for a while to get some interest going, but, you know. Okay. But there's, there's, there's many other people in advertising who got, who got so much better military credentials to do that. Now, do you feel that there's uh, – you've been in advertising for so long. You know your stuff. You've probably done everything you wanted to do, but are there any – companies that you would just die to interview today like to, or not to, sorry, not to advertise for wow. pardon me there's got to be some wow I wish you would have emailed me that question yesterday <laughs> <laughs> okay and what was your yeah. favorite that you have done uh, my strange enough one of my favorite clients I've worked for some really nice clients uh, some really good people you know, it's, uh, I remember my client at Bright now, which wasn't the biggest client, 300 dental office. Rick Brown was a great guy. We got along really well. Worked with a lot of great people. Uh, but I worked on Epson printers, and they make really great photographic printers. And I used to be a professional photographer, and my undergrad was in photography, so that was the one time I worked on an account that I was passionate about printing. About. Yes, and I worked with my partner then was a guy named Seraphim Conchola, and he was also a photographer. So they had two people working on their account that probably knew as much about it or more so than they did. That is but way we too were, it was it was just great working on that because we would be talking to ourselves. Just loving it. Yes. Now, we'll be back right after this break. We're going to talk more about your incredible facts and about your work. Stay tuned. Awesome. We 
are back with Rick Bursky, who is the marketing and advertising connoisseur. Now, before the break, we touched a bit on some amazing facts about this man, but before we run back to the facts, what I want to touch on briefly is um, we mentioned having a formula for fantastic advertising. Yeah. I don't want to use the word formula, so to speak, but there's mm -hmm. techniques involved. Mm, okay. And when students get to my class, the, the copywriting class I typically do in the fall, they kind of show up in class thinking, oh, I'm not talented. Mm -hmm. And I tell them talent has nothing to do with it. There's no such thing as talent, and there's forget about creativity. And you make creativity, you make yourself creative. Mm -hmm. So we, we start learning about some techniques, what to do, uh, some ways to approach it, because it's just problem solving. We learn in our life to solve all sorts of problems, so we basically have a creative problem, we're gonna solve it in a creative way, and there's ways mm -hmm. to do that. So what you need is, forget about talent, you need to have intelligence, and the students are smart, they wouldn't be here if they're not, and they need to be passionate, they need to be driven, and they need to work hard. Mm. And that's how you come up with this. But there are techniques. There are probably only a dozen ads in the world. There's like, it could be hyperbole, it could be by metaphor. An ad could be, you know, could we take something negative that people say about it and make it a positive? Mm. Could we, there, there's all these techniques. And then you gotta allow for just like, you know, sudden strike of like, out of the air, something comes up. But you know, you learn ways to approach these problems and they're creative problems and you learn to solve them in certain ways. Okay, so if someone, if let's say a company comes to us, see you, and okay. they say, hey, we have these really ugly mugs, which they're actually kind of ugly, and <laughs> they want to sell these. Yeah, so it's like, how all of a sudden, how does ugly become such a, like, you know, a hot a item? Hot how, thing. Yeah, it is just like, you know, it's... Yeah, sexy mug. Yeah, it's Maybe like, we get models. Well, you see, <laughs> that's the easy way, but it's like, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's like improve your mug i don't know it's like a wow a, okay you know, a mug shot I'm, I'm not going to try and solve it a here mug but mug shot it is it is you listen know. i feel like i'm getting a free job now yeah, I, it, i'm gonna have to steal that and go yes to a mug company and say i have this concept of mug shots for mugs yes it is i i, I got a feeling that one's been done already has it yeah it's 2017 <laughs> there's very little that's new under the sun often a creative idea is two different ideas that you bring together in a new way hmm. but there's very little that's new under the sun okay now, I want to jump back to this list because there's we'll a few things on We'll see how good the water here. tastes from this cup. <laughs> uh, it's it's mm. university water. Uh -huh. Nikias has been investing in those pointy things so much yes. on campus. <laughs> we haven't, the water, they haven't even touched on that yet. Now, uh, you, we talked briefly before we walked in the studio about you breaking both of your feet. Yes, I Legs, broke both feet. at the same time. Okay. Actually, the, it was the front of the foot on one and the ankle of the other, but close enough I on both feet. Can I ask the story, or is that? No, it's. Uh, I was in a restaurant, just got showed up at the restaurant, and I asked the waitress where the ATM machine was because I needed to pay the, pay, the, pay the valet, and she said it's right behind you, which she neglected to tell me as I was standing right at the top of the steps, <gasps> and I turned around and went right down the steps, two steps this far, and that's all it took. I hope they didn't make you pay for your meal. We didn't even order at that point. Just had two <laughs> drinks, but no, they didn't. <laughs> they should have comped you at least a dessert. <laughs> they, they, oh, I, there was a lot of pain involved. I didn't stay around. Now and I just you... recovered from the broken wrist. What? Okay, they, and they, yeah, they what they happened just to the put, wrist? They just put a metal plate in my hand. Well, can I ask what happened yeah, to the wrist? Yeah, I was driving on the freeway, 405 going south. I looked next to the next lane. There's a school bus. On top of the school bus, two ISIS terrorists planting a bomb. So I left from my car onto the school bus, threw the terrorists off, grabbed the bomb, threw the bomb, and the bomb <laughs> went off about 10 feet from my hand. Okay, that might not be exactly true, but it's but much more right exciting. There. Much more exciting <laughs> than the real way. Do I want another real story? I was playing tennis. Okay. So you should have... <laughs> yeah. We could really, have done without what that. What was really annoying is I was winning, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, you just have to take that out at that point. Yes. That's a loss. Um, you have been in a plane crash? I crashed one airplane, but I didn't break any bones when I crashed a plane. I have a pilot's license. What? Okay, so yeah, and I see here you've flown... 251 hours. Yes, a beginner, but yes, it was, and that was probably about 114, 114th hour. You I might crashed at a van, I be the Dos Equis man. <laughs> I'm not, not kidding at all. Yeah. Uh, 190 scuba dives. Yes, it's, uh, but I didn't break any bone scuba diving either. But I did have to be rescued from the bottom of the ocean on my first night dive. I got lost from everyone and trapped in kelp, and they had to come find me and cut me out of the kelp. So that was. You, wow. You've survived a lot. Yes. There's, I don't think side. there's much you could say you haven't done. It's uh, never put my head in an alligator. <laughs> we have to do that next. Yes. Uh, you have a home library of more than 3,000 books. I have them cataloged. You could get a great program called Read Aware for 40 bucks online. You get a barcode okay. reader. And yes, I'm addicted <laughs> to buying books. Uh, so it's probably about 
3700 they're not all cataloged yet i'm out of space do you have any books shelf space i can rent at your place you I, you could take the whole place yeah. we basically have no furniture right now yeah. because we're all broke um five fun field appearances on national television game show i was on match game the tv show when i was in the what? army Okay, and you have to explain to me what Mass Game is. Match Game. Match Game. With Gene Rayburn, it was the highest rated game show of its time. It's like, you'd sit there and say, okay, the uh, so-and-so is so dumb, they use blank for wallpaper. And you'd write down something, toilet paper, newspaper, and you have to match with the celebrities. And I was in the wow. Army at the time, okay. and I had to get the Army's permission to be on the show. And then at the end, got a little tr got in a little trouble with the army. They approved it, but I was on for a week. The highest rated game show of its day. And as the credits were rolling, Gene Rayburn put his arm around me. I was in uniform and said, "So, Rick, what are you going to do with all that money?" And I said, "Gene, I'm going to buy my way out of the army." Army has no sense of humor. I can only imagine. Yes. <laughs> well, you know what? You were true to yourself. Yes. That was yes. a Tommy Loren moment, I guess yes. we can say. <laughs> <laughs> and you hid out in Europe for two years? That's what, with the army, so you had hiding out. You're in Germany, you're in Italy. Oh, okay. Yes. So you, you, were, you were hiding for a good cause. Yes. All right. And this one's my favorite. 98 fountain pens. That's actually not true. Uh, I got to update those stats. It's probably about <laughs> 120 of them. Yeah. What? Okay, so what do these run you? Uh, you know, they run this anywhere from... Beautiful collection. I'm sorry. That's not my collection. I was taking it to Los Angeles International Fountain Pen oh. Show, which was this last month. Someone. <laughs> you should have taken credit for it. I have, I have more pens than that. That's not that many. I like but the comments, too. OMG. OMG. Yes. Uh, you know, some of the pens, an inexpensive pen would be $50. Uh, one of my more expensive ones would be $1,000. You know, if anything written with a fountain pen will be better than if it was written w without a fountain pen. Oh it's like, goodness. you know, it's like we have... This is actually a new pen. Most of my pens are... are uh, vintage pens, and this is a Conklin Dual Graph. That's fairly inexpensive for a fountain pen, but it's really smooth. You can write with it there. All right, you're gonna have your to name. teach me how to write with yes. this, unfortunately. Yes. Is it? Are we going so that everyone can see level yes. side up or level side this down? Over here. Okay. And it's incredibly smooth. Wow. So now turn around like this. Yeah. Write your name with it. S oh, I did it wrong. C. You can spell your name. You can try. U yes. You. At. Oh. You. Oh, you know what? I noticed that there's. It's a, there's a level yes, but it that if be you more, point it the correct way. It would be more like this. Yeah. Ah, so it's just a light. Yes. Oh. You, you have to practice to get used to it. So you how does that terrible. one feel? This feels exceptional. I feel incompetent. Well, you know so what? It, it this pen demeaning. you could keep. This is a gift. You could keep this pen. <laughs> really? Yes. You could keep that pen. <laughs> Thank That's you. Yes. And you just have to practice with it. Okay. I'm not going to lie. It's a daunting pen. It feels demeaning because I feel like I'm not able to write with it yet. It, it takes practice. And maybe that's a skill that I need to... You, you, you should, it's a skill you should have. So I have to ask how this became a passion of yours. How did you... I was a junior copywriter in an ad agency and I for an ad, saw an ad for a pen, the Parker Premier, and I thought, I should have one nice pen. And I looked up the price. It was 175 bucks, and I was not making very much money, so I saved for a year and I bought that pen. I still have that pen. And then wow. a year later, I bought a second pen and a third. And uh, then I had mostly modern pens, and I was in a meeting with the president of DDB with a bunch of people. And as I was leaving the meeting, someone said, hey, Rick, the actually the president of the agency said, hey, Rick, someone told me you collect fountain pens. And I said, I do. And he said, I bought this at a garage sale years ago, and it was an antique pen, and he gave it to me. And that's how I started collecting the old pens. Wow. And how much do these range? I mean, you mentioned that this was 50. Yeah, I have like up to like about 1,000, but you can find pens for 10, 20,000. Good yeah, it's, Lord. Uh, but at any given time, I have three pens with me inked. Wow. Okay. And yes. so I'm assuming if I was taking your course, buying you a, an, a fountain pen would secure me at least a B. Uh, it depends what kind of pen. Like, you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, if it would it'd have to be. Uh, I, I put out that in the beginning, yeah. Okay. Yes. So all the students know. Yes, they know. Now, I have to ask, you've done so much. Your career has been extensive. It seems like you've done everything that you could want to do. Do you have an idea of what you want your legacy to be? Wow. Uh, one of the things I really like when I watch some of my students become very successful in advertising, mm -hmm. it's great when uh, years ago well, I saw some ads for BMW and they were great. They were truly great. I found out that someone who was one of my students did the wow. ads. Now she's a New York creative director. And I sent her a note. I said, wow, I'm so jealous. I wish I did. And she wrote back and she goes, in a certain way, you did the ads because if I didn't take mm. your class, I wouldn't have done them. So it's like, wow, what could you ask for? Annenberg is <laughs> probably uh, in love with you. Yeah, well, it's, uh, <laughs> um, but 
I hope I have a few more books left in me. I've written some books of poetry, so I hope there's going to be a few more books left in me, and I hope there's a Nobel Prize before I die. But okay, and I <laughs> that's probably not happening. I'm only kidding, guys. <laughs> I noticed that you have you have a new book. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, I'm no longer troubled by the extravagance. Is out from Boa Editions. Beautiful and, cover. Yes, thank beautiful, you so much. So it's really fun. I'm an Eastern European duendeist, and most of the poems are surreal love poems. Nothing now, to do with advertising, but. Now, if people want to purchase that book. Amazon, or you could order in the bookstore anywhere. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I have to thank you plug. a million times for your yeah. time. It was my pleasure. For your wisdom. And we'll be back to see you guys next week. Stay tuned. The year was 1938, and the U.S. sat on the brink of another world war. The American people looked for diversion from the trials and tribulations of a new century and its new problems. In 1940, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt authorized the release of an entirely new form of entertainment. Today, a hope of many years standing is in large part fulfilled. It was called the Trojan Visual and Auditory Mimeograph Device, or Trojan Vision for short. As bombs fell and war was waged, society tuned to 8.1 for relief. Throughout American history, Trojan Vision has shown us the moments of America's triumphs, spreading the finest programming throughout Greater Los Angeles and worldwide online. Watch Trojan Vision and see history being made.